you can have it every year on campus except for the fall.
I am not Jessie. Um, Jessie has the day off today, so um, I'll be leading her parts of the service apart from the uh, sermon, which is going to be a video conversation between her and Jennifer Barchi, and you'll hear more about that um, a little bit later. And she's sp spoken about Jennifer Barchi, I think, some in the last few weeks anyway. Um, as far as announcements go, um, I don't have much. Um, put this on your calendars. Um, in two weeks, we have our annual fall work day on the 11th, so please be here, help us. We have a number of property-related tasks to take care of, and uh, all hands are welcome and would uh, be, be appreciated. Um, the only other announcement I, that I know of, if anyone has anything, please feel free to raise your hand and say it, is um, we've had some issues with access during the day in the building. We're trying to um, control access a little bit more because of the preschool and the rules related to the preschool. So please just do your best to come before or after preschool hours during the day. That would be a big help. All right, thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, please join me in the opening prayers printed in your bulletin. We share one faith, have one calling, are of one soul and one mind. Have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism. Eat of one bread and drink of one cup. Confess one name, are obedient to one Lord. Together we come to know the height and breadth and the depth of the love of Christ. We know and bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. Admonishing and comforting one another, that we suffer with one another for the sake of righteousness. Together we pray, together we serve God in this world. Thanks be to God.
my exercise today. The first scripture reading this morning is from Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plan. The Lord works out everything in its proper and end, even the wicked, for the day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. He will not go unpunished. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. Better a little in righteousness than much gain with injustice. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This was mainly for trip. Hello. Yes, we can all do it. Okay, so hi, trip. You're the only kid here today. Do you want to come stand with me? No? Okay. I will stand here myself. Um, well, we were going to talk about what we've been learning about in Sunday school, but since it's just one of us, I thought maybe we would just sing. Should we do that, trip? Should we sing this little light of mine? You can't? Well, we'll, how about we all do it together? Should we all do it? Because we sing this every Sunday school, right? Okay, ready? Do you have your light? No. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Then we share it with the world, right? Share it with the world. I'm going to let it shine, share it with the world. I'm gonna let it shine, share it with the world. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yay! <laughs> okay, yeah, I think, should we, should we do a prayer? Okay, we'll do a prayer. So in Sunday school, we've talked a lot about gratitude and we've talked a lot about, like, um, if you're going through something hard, like somebody's playing with your toy or somebody's mean to you or school is hard, it, it means that God didn't leave us, right? He's still there. And if you're having a hard time, you can ask, you can tell God, and you can also ask him for help, or you can pray and say thank you, Right? Okay, so we'll do one of our prayers that I'm making up right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we close our eyes and we say, Dear God, Dear God, thank you so much for being with us through our good times and our hard times. There are so many wonderful things in my life, it's hard to keep count. There are so many wonderful things in my life, it's hard to keep count. And I know that even when I'm facing something hard or sad, you have not left me. You are with me all the time. 
Amen. Okay. Our second scripture reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound teaching, but having their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, be sober in everything, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. You know, I'm not able to be there physically present with you this morning, but I'm so glad to get to be virtually present and also with my friend and colleague, um, Jennifer Barchi, 
Um, many of us know her because she's been working with our session since February of 2023. She's been coming and coaching us through a deep discernment process to get us to the point of these values that you were hearing about during the stewardship campaign. But I wanted to give you a fuller picture of who she is. She is Baltimore Presbytery's Strategic Associate for Spiritual Leader Development. And her coaching role, she is the senior consultant with Design Group International. So she brings a wealth of experience to us. And she really helped us to wrestle through these questions. And we thought a, a great way to end the Stewardship Sermon series would be to hear from her today. Thanks, Jennifer, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to be with you all virtually. Yeah. And you you might get to see her in person again one day. She has visited us before. Um, but we'll just dive right into some of our questions for conversation. Jennifer, what was the process of discernment like with the COA session? Uh, it was it was such a joy. Um, it was so fun to be with all of all of the elders um, and with everyone who attended those session meetings in the session retreat. Um, and what I loved most was hearing the stories from everybody about why the, it is they love being a part of Christ Our Anchor. It really gave a sense of just how deeply uh, intertwined in each of your lives Christ Our Anchor is, and the really important place that Christ Our Anchor ha had for each of you in, um, in supporting you and welcoming you and forming you. Um, so that was a true joy. Um, in terms of the mechanics of it, uh, it's important to know that uh, as we went through this process, one of the things that we talked about was that there is sort of four types of values that we think of when we think about doing um, core value work. So there are, um, and I'm actually going to go to core values last. So there are what we call pay to play values. And those are values that are expected or required of any organization within your sector. So for churches, that's often um, we believe in Jesus Christ or we worship the triune God. We, um, even things like we, um, we pray daily, something like that. Things that you would expect that a church would have to say in order to be a church. Um, and if it weren't a value, then you would say, oh, okay, then maybe you shouldn't be considered a church. <laughs> maybe that's not who you are. Um, so that's the pay to play value set. And we, we sort of set those aside. Then there are the aspirational values. Those are values that you might say you really, really want. Um, those are the things that you aspire to. We often aspire to things like being um, radically hospitable. But we might ask the question, well, how does that show up? Are we really actually radic radical in our hospitality? So that's the aspirational zone. Then there are the accidental values. Um, those are the ones where we may not like that they're a part of the way that we act towards one another, um, but they they do show up. They show up in our meetings. They show up in our daily interactions. I've worked with churches where an accidental value is um, being so stuck, for example, in a routine that if anything breaks that routine, people uh, get very, very upset and they might even uh, yell or um, or or um, in a way like punish people who threaten the routine. So accidental values, we all have them. Every organization has them. Um, for example, at the Presbytery level, one of the things that we've talked about is sometimes one of our accidental values is when we're not sure what to do, we just sort of don't do anything. We get mired in inaction, hmm. um, which is not how we want to act, but it is it is how we have wound up uh, accidentally behaving. And when we talk about values, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about how we behave together. Um, and so the last category, and that's really what we focused on with session, was core values. So what are the core values? And those are the values that are so important to us as an organization that 
we'd be willing to lose sleep over them. We'd be willing to risk money over them. We'd be willing as churches, this is a big one, we'd be willing to lose members by sticking up for them. So they're impor so important to us that we would literally put money, uh, membership, uh, sleep, um, et cetera, on the line in order to that was the, those are the tech, that's the technical side of the participant. And then what you all heard about as a church were those core values, those four or five that we discerned were really at the heart of who we are and who we want to be. Um, certainly what we're willing to take risks for. Um, and so the rest of these questions are kind of going to build on those values that we discerned. So Jennifer, how do you think we build on the diversity that's already present in our church to live up to that value of gathering as an eclectic, imperfect people? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I want to say I love the values that you guys have described. They're so incredibly rich um, and they're so very creative, which I think is really powerful and really sets you apart from other congregations. Um, when I was reflecting on this question, so Jesse sent me these questions ahead of time. And as I was reflecting on it, um, part of the way that I work as a consultant is really to draw out the expertise that is already in the room because you all are the experts in Christ our Anchor. I'm not, um, I, you know, it's your congregation. So I'm here to be a partner with you. And so my question sort of back would be to say, well, if you took that value of gathering as um, an eclectic, imperfect group of people, right? And you really let it settle in your imagination. What would it look like for you to live that value out perfectly? So if you could live it perfectly, what is the picture that you would paint of Christ our anchor as gathering as eclectic, imperfect people? Um, and really, describe that image for yourselves, for one another, um, share those images. And then the first step I would say is, what is one easy thing that you can do to get yourself just a little bit closer to what that image is that you have, um, that you've described? And I think one of the challenges when it comes to diversity always is how do we how do we live in diversity when we know that that may ask us to give up something that we've held dear in order to welcome someone else who might hold something else dear? And so it's both a working of the imagination to think about what you want as the end goal, and it's a being really honest about the things that you're going to have to grieve along the way. So any change process, any any process of moving towards something new is also a process of grief, mm -hmm. right? Because no matter how good the change is, no matter how good the transformation is, you're always going to have to leave something behind. Um, and so giving yourselves time to do what is really holy work in terms of grieving what it is that you may have to give up in order to achieve the diversity that you really want. Mm, thank you so much. Um, and then from your interactions with our leaders, what insights did that give you, Jennifer, into our church culture that we are continually building? You talk about people having to make room for each other and give things up. And what insights have you seen or observations do you have about our church culture? Yeah. One of the things that's really struck me about working with your leadership is the capacity that you already have for difficult conversations. So it was clear that your leaders don't always agree on things, right? And um, that's not a bad thing that I wanna lift that up as being, we should celebrate that. And inevitably, in almost every training that I've done, I've had one person who said, you know, as we're going through these words that are often negative, I've had one person who said, right, but conflict is, good conflict you know without conflict we never lead to we never get to 
um, new ideas and new opportunities. Often conflict is generative. It provides us with uh, inspiration because we're, we're actually engaged with people who think differently than we do. That's really important. And in fact, that's correct. Conflict is a natural and normal part of human life. And it is ultimately what leads to new ideas, new beginnings, new starts. Mm -hmm. um, and so in watching the leadership's capacity to disagree, that actually gives me great hope um, for the overall church's capacity to do something that is new, to do something that is generative. And so what I would say is, um, a really important thing to cultivate is that healthy capacity to disagree throughout all of all levels of your congregation. Um, and really just to, to lean into that, to see it as being not a bad thing, but something that is going to help you move forward. The other thing that I think I'd say is just the, um, we have a tendency as, as humans, especially when we're under stress, and I don't think anyone in, in the PCUSA could say that churches are not under stress right now. Mm -hmm. um, we are. I think many people across the United States would say that they're feeling under stress, period, whether they're part of a church or not. Um, but certainly church leadership always feels this at the moment. Mm -hmm. When we're in that, under that stress, there is a certain sense of urgency that it presses us to move quickly. And my urging is always to slow down. It may not feel like you, you can, right? It, it may feel like if we slow down, terrible things are gonna happen. And yet I would still say, don't rush a process like this. Don't rush through work that needs to be done. Don't rush to uh, move through a change process too quickly. But what does that like really look like when you're in the midst of a conflict? If we're willing to tolerate it and it happens inevitably, what does that look like, do you think, to trust one another, to value our community? My first comment is always going to be, again, to turn it back to if you were to put, like, if you were really to try to engage your imagination with this and believe that imagination is a holy endeavor because it is, it's God given. Um, and we see so much use of imagination in scripture. What, what would it look like if you imagined Christ our anchor living out that value perfectly, right? Trusting one another. I think holding up that vision of what we're moving towards is also very powerful because it reminds us when times get hard of, of why, of what matters, right? It's the why, this is why we're doing it. Um, but to that, to that, I would also say, um, often when times, when we're moving through processes that invite us into periods of change, um, and especially when we are holding a community that is diverse together, um, there become there comes a tendency for us to split into this this sort of thinking of who's with us and who's against us, right? Um, it's this idea of who's on our side and who's not on our side. Sure. And when we fall into that sort of thinking, we start to find any reason we can to demonize um, or to other the party that we think is not with us. And part of that is often thinking about um, them wanting something other than what we want or not valuing what we value. Um, and so trusting, the, the, really living into that value of trusting that others value the Christ or Anchor community just as much as we do is an invitation to remember that we are all linked, you are all linked in this community by that love. Every member of Christ Our Anchor loves their church. Every member loves it. And so when they are operating, when they're, when they're speaking, when they're describing a want that might be different from what your want is, 
it's not because they want to hurt you. It's because they love their church and they want what's best for it. And their understanding of what's best for it might be different than your understanding of what's best for it. Right. And so the question becomes, all right, so we both want this church to be its best and we have different visions for what that looks like. How can we bring those visions together in a way that allows us to work towards something that is common? Hmm. Or how can we hold on to the love that we have for Christ our anchor and let that be what binds us together? Yes. Even if we don't agree necessarily on the direction we're headed. Right. Right. At least we can agree on that. Um, And the last value, Jennifer, seems contradictory. How can we be both a unified church and embrace everyone's unique journey of faith? How can we do both at the same time faithfully? Yeah. So one of, the question that immediately comes up for me is, well, what does it mean to be a unified church? Mm. You know, what are we talking about when we say that we're unified? Are we unified because we all believe exactly the same thing and we've all, all had exactly the same experience? Or are we unified because we value the same things? We um, are working towards a similar goal or because there is another commonality that we share. Um, I, what I think of when it comes to um, being a unified church where everyone is, um, where everyone's unique walk of faith is, is valued. I think about people sharing their unique faith journeys with one another. Um, and, being able to be vulnerable and having that level of trust where they're able to talk about where they've been and how they're experiencing God and the spirit in their lives Mm. um, and what their encounters with Christ have been. Um, And even if those are different, even if theology is different, that it's that level of storytelling, of sharing, of vulnerability, of trust that is actually what unites you all as a congregation. Um, and my guess is that the more that you are vulnerable with each other and share those unique journeys, um, the more you're going to feel connected to each other, the more you're going to find commonalities that um, even if even if you come from very different backgrounds or are in different, very, very different places right now, you'll, you'll discover that, in fact, there are places where your paths might have either overlapped or there are places where stories intersect. Mm. Um, that become very m- meaningful. Mm. And I know that you'll continue to work with us a little bit longer, Jennifer, but with these more clearly defined values that we're now all aware of as a community, what would you recommend our next steps be? So to some degree, that would be a conversation for a leadership to really wrestle with, to think about what feels most important. Um, I will say that often what winds up happening next is, one, I, I will encourage you all to really think about how, what it means to live into these values. So what does it look like to act this way, to act um, in light of all five of your values every day, every time you are together with every gathering? What does it look like to say, what would our session meetings look like if we brought them in line? Like, are our session meetings in line with these values? Is the way that we worship in line with these values? Is, you know, is our Sunday school in line with these values? Are the ways that we interact during coffee hour in line with these values? Um, and if they're not, what changes might you want to make? And I always encourage people to start with things that are small and measurable um, so that you feel like you're making progress and not trying to bite off more than is reasonable <laughs> at first. Um, but in terms of the broader scope of work, it's often, often next steps include something like um, developing a, a vision based on the values. So what is that world that you would be creating if you were to live out your, your values perfectly? And how, what's the vision that that creates for you? Um, or we think about mission. Okay, so if values are how you behave and the vision is the why that drives you, what is the world you're working towards? 
the mission is what is it that you actually do in the world mm. what it, it's the what mm. what are you about as a congregation mm-hmm. so, so this is the how we're mm-hmm. working towards the why and mm-hmm. Can, reconsidering all of what we do if it fits in with those with the how and the what yeah. exactly yeah. yeah yeah well you have spent a tremendous amount of time and energy and given us so many of your gifts I wonder if as the whole church is listening to you now do you have any final words of wisdom or blessing for us so a couple of things first just a just a real um prayer for you all to have holy imaginations and to to find the um, the time and the space to relax into that holy imagination that you can dream about what it is that you're working towards um, and that you would have patience um, and be willing to slow down in a world that tells you that you need to go faster and faster and faster. Mm. Um, but the biggest thing um, that I'd really like to leave me with is actually a poem by the American poet Wendell Berry. Hmm. Um, and it's a poem that's called Our Real Work, um, and it goes like this. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work, and that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sinks. That's really, I'd love to leave you with that. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here. Amen. Yeah, thank you.
And now's the time of the service when we get to share our joys and concerns and bring those to God. Um, earlier when I opened the service, I said that I'm not Pastor Jesse. One of the things that she does really well is she knows everyone's name. And when you call and she says your name, she repeats what you say. So please forgive me. I may not know everyone's name. So just in a, to help me out a little bit, if I call on you, if you could say your name and then your joy or concern, and then we'll say, Lord, hear our prayer or praise the Lord at the end based on it being a joy or concern. Anyone? Prayers for Bob's co-worker, whose daughter um, recently died of cancer. Lord, hear our prayer. Prayers for the people of Maine and for healing for their community. Lord, hear our prayer. Prayers for PJ and her family. Lord, hear our prayer. Yes, but no, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. Lord, hear our prayer. Is that all? All right. God, you've heard our, our, our prayers. Um, for our joys, we, we give you thanks and praise. For our concerns, we ask for grace, mercy, and healing. And we humbly pray, as your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Aware of the bounty of God, let me start a little. Aware of the bounty of God's created earth, we are invited now to give generously from our abundance. Let us share God's blessings as we collect our tithes and offerings. Could the ushers please come forward?
So in closing today, um, I wonder if you'd join me in a little exercise. Um, in, in the spirit of the sermon series that we've just concluded in today's conversation, I'm going to say we treasure, and I would like for you as best you can to repeat each of our uh, values uh, with me. And um, so there are five of them. I'll say them out loud and do your best to join me if you, if you, if you would. We treasure gathering as an eclectic and perfect people. We treasure building. I'm sorry about that. I guess my instructions weren't clear. Okay, let's do it that way. I'll say it and then you, then you repeat after me. How about that? <laughs> I was hoping we would all do it together, but um, that didn't work so well. So, all right, I'll start over again. We treasure gathering as an eclectic and perfect people. We treasure building a church culture together. We treasure trusting one another to value the COA community. We treasure listening to understand. And we treasure embracing everyone's unique journey of faith. The benediction comes from Romans chapter 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.